Hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon and good evening to some of you. My name is Siti Rohana and I'm your host for today's webinar brought to you by ASO. So in this webinar, we'll look at HDR basics, human visual aspects, and how to set your post suite with the reference to SMPTE ST2080 and also Netflix, Disney, and YouTube setups. Also, we'll touch on the GUI and client monitors. This webinar will be approximately about 45 minutes. So if you have any questions along the way, you can post it on the chat box below. At the end of this webinar, we'll be answering those questions. Uh, in any case, if your questions were unanswered, we will follow up with you after the webinar. Yep. And this webinar is recorded. So we will send you a link also after the webinar. Okay, all right, let's begin. Uh, let me introduce you, Stuart Poynton. He is uh, ASO's video workflow specialist who has more than 40 years of experience in the broadcast, post as well as on-set production. Over to you, Stuart. Hello, everybody. It's Stuart here from the south coast of New South Wales. The NBN here is a little bit sketchy sometimes, so if my voice does fade after a few minutes, please bear with me. I'm not falling asleep. It's just the Australian Broadband Network. And it's great to see everybody uh, joining up today. Some familiar names that I see there. Um, so let's get started. Let me share my screen. And there we go. Awesome. And look at that. We're off. Okay. So what we want to do is just to go through, as Siddy said, some basics on HDR and how to set up your post suite. So it's really critically important if you're going to be into the HDR world that you have the, your system set up correctly before you even start grading. So you can see things like shadow details, highlights and that sort of thing in the, in the environment that you're in is um, correct for color grading um, for, uh, for your work. So let's just, Go to mouse and so I'm going to be referring to the ASO Prominence CG3146 HDR monitor, which is a big long sentence. So I'll quite often just refer to it as the CG3146, or even sometimes the 3146 being an Australian, we tend to shorten things down. This is really a world top class critical grade HDR and SDR reference monitor. So it's 32 inches, it's a 4K DCI, which means it's got a 4096 by 2160 resolution. It uh, does 1000 nits. The spec is greater than 1000 to one contrast ratio. It has 12G SDI and HDMI, so it can fit into any environment that you may use in a post environment. Wide gamut and one of its really key features. It also has a built-in colorimeter, which won the uh, HBA, the Hollywood Producers Association's Award for Engineering. So that's the only one in the world that uh, monitor in the world for HDR that has a, of a critical level that has its own built-in colorimeter. So let's have a look at some of the basics and a few terms that we can go through to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about. So NIT is a measure of luminance, and luminance is basically how bright something is. An EOTF is the electro-optical transfer function. That's basically coming out of your resolve system into the display. The optoelectrical is the camera function, taking the image that you capture from the camera and creating electrical signal. Then there's the perceptual quantization, which is one of the two HDR formats we're going to be looking at today. And that's your ST2084, the Dolby Vision, HDR10, style of HDR. There's the hybrid log gamma, which was developed by NHK and BBC, and that's really used for broadcasting live um, HDR work. So we're going to be concentrating on the PQ today. And why you'll see in the a lot of the um, components, say Y, C, B, C, R, for instance, the Y is luminance. And you'll see quite often that the you'll see a Y dash, which is Luma. So Luma means that it's had a transfer function applied to it. So Luma is linear light and Y dash is Luma. If you see a Y dash dash, 
that generally means it's a HDR transfer, uh, transfer function up here. Okay, so let's have a quick look at what HDR is. High dynamic range obviously is what that means. And it doesn't mean high brightness. It means we're looking at the total dynamic range from black to white, all that whole range there. So much higher than what the REC 709 is. So it's not just about high brightness. Resolution is 4K to 8K. So there's, there's basically two versions of that. So it operates in a very high resolution. And of course, it's wide gamut with REC 2020 with P3 being the, the minimum standard. Some other key points about this is that the PQ HDR is an absolute uh, reference uh, system to 10,000 nits. But HDR does not mean black or blacks in SDR. This is one of the misunderstandings that people have. So when I calibrate the CG3146, for instance, in SDR, the black level is exactly the same as the HDR level. Black is the same. It depends on the display capabilities. The EATF will change things like shadow detail and what have you, but the actual black in SDR and HDR is the same. It's not just about brightness either. So you can get some high brightness monitors, for instance, but that, they're not HDR. It's about the total dynamic range from black to peak white. And it doesn't mean all things should be more colorful either. For instance, uh, measuring the, if you're doing a Coca-Cola ad, for instance, then if you measured the, um, the red on the Coca-Cola, that red on the Coca-Cola is actually the REC 709 primary or an sRGB uh, red primary. So you must ensure that that red is exactly the same red, whether it be in an SDR or in a HDR environment. And it is fantastic when it's done right, but like all things in HDR, we start to work with the human visual system far more so than we would in the SDR world. So you need to be careful about what you do, but when you do it, HDR is, I think, fantastic when it's done correctly. So there's two basic systems we look at, the uh, the PQ, the perceptual quantizer and the HLG. Some key differences between this. So the PQ is referenced to a display of 10,000 nits and it's an absolute luminance format. So this is totally different to the normal way of what we've operated in in the REC 709 world, your 2084 EOTF. The other key point about the PQ is it uses metadata. So these two points here you must keep in mind when you're doing HDR productions. And then you have HDR10, HDR10 plus and Dolby Vision. They're all subsets of basically the, the PQ system. The HLG, the hybrid log gamma, designed for broadcast. So it's a relative system and it has no metadata. So it's much more uh, easy to use when you're doing live, uh, say FIFA and stuff like that, football games or broadcasting in hybrid log gamma. They also did things like Blue Planet was released in hybrid log gamma as well. So there's two critical differences between the PQ and the hybrid log gamma. And one is the absolute luminance format with metadata. One is a relative, same as to, uh, REC 709 and no metadata. So some of our minimum requirements, we have a black level of 0 0.005 of a nit and our peak white of 1,000 nit. And therefore we get a contrast ratio of 200,000 to one. So contrast ratio is simply 1,000 divided by 0 0.000, whoops, my thing has gone crazy. I'll do that again. Is 1,000 divided by 0 0.005, and that equals 200,000 to one. When I measure the 3146 for calibration, the spec is 1 million to 1 or greater than 1 million to 1. But I commonly measure the, uh, the CG3146 at 0 0.005, which gives a, an effective contrast ratio of 2 million to 1. So the CG3146 is a, a very, um, very good in that regard, that it, it certainly meets those requirements. The other minimum is a P3 color space. Even though things like BT2100 is REC2020, no monitor uh, in existence at the moment can meet that uh, display color space. So we use P3 as an interim um, color space to, to 
uh, HDR work. The other thing which we're going to look at is the surround extend luminance. It should be five nits, which is in the basically the peripheral viewing behind the monitor when you're seeing in your grading room. And any light outside of that should be less than or equal to five nits. And of course, D65 is the, the light correlated color temperature that you should be having. Now, that sounds fairly obvious you should do so, but I go into very many uh, post suites and I find there's practicals in the corner that might be tungsten and that sort of thing. So you should make sure all the light sources in your suite are D65. That really is an important feature. Okay, let's just having a look at some color spaces. So XYZ is our uh, main mother of all color spaces, if you like, which we use, and that was developed from the CIE 1931. But within that, the practical color spaces we use are REC 2020, which is the, the color space for BT 2100. And then we have the DCI-P3, this green one, and REC, 20, uh, REC 789, the blue one. So REC, uh, DCI-P3 sits entirely within the REC 2020 gamut. And when we look at the Disney um, color space and their formats later on, you'll see that how that works. So that's basically that entire color space sits within that REC 2020. It's important to understand that color is three-dimensional. Quite often we see plots like this, and this is a, a calibration verification of a CG3146 in REC 789. So all those green dots mean that those colors are less than delta E 2000 of one, which means they're totally imperceptible. But when, we, when I calibrate them and we do reports, those reports include the entire three uh, 3D color volume. So we're looking at luminance through to black as well as the entire color gamut. And you can see here that the CG3146 in that entire color gamut across from black all the way through to peak white has delta E errors less than one. And that's a 1000 patch verification. Bit depth plays a critical role in HDR. In SDR, Rec 709, you can get away with a lot of things by putting just any old image on the timeline and, and, and making it work within your environment. But when we get to the HDR world, we really don't want to use 8-bit at all. It's, it's the minimum requirement really is a 10-bit system. And the reason is because we'll get banding. And banding is very offensive to us as human beings. So basically what happens in your bit depth, you get your, your grayscale levels and your various channels and it splits it up into to various levels here. And you have this little level here. So our human visual system in Rec 709 with 100 nit can't see any difference here. But when we go to HDR, that, that level becomes much bigger. And therefore our eye can start to see the difference between these two levels. And that's what you see as banding. And we're very sensitive to that and it's highly offensive. So you must clear away and stay away from 8-bit images um, in, in at all possible cases. So this is an interesting chart that you'll start to get into when you work with HDR. And this is from Ray Knight, who was a color scientist back in the 1940s. And... Um, uh, were from Marshall and Talbot in the 1940s. A lot of work was done in colour in the 1940s with David McAdam and you might have heard of McAdam ellipses. But what this shows is this is the brightness scale here. And as we go along, you can see these, these lines get, start to get steeper and bigger as we go up. What that means is, is that our ability to see differences in grayscale levels increases as the brightness increases. So when we're talking about HDR, we go from 100 nits in SDR to 1000 nits. As we go up that scale in brightness, our ability to see differences increases. So therefore the opportunity to see banding in poor images also increases that you wouldn't normally see in SDR. So it's really mind to keep in mind that your human visual system will start to change as you start to work with HDR images. And it's the same with color as well. So there's a thing called the Hunt effect. And the Hunt effect is basically as brightness increases, colors appear more colorful as well. So there's, a, there's some important things to keep in mind when you're working in the HDR world that your human visual system will start to work differently. So our 
human visual system, we have very high acuity. So acuity is basically our ability to, to perceive, say, resolution, if you like, as a, as a word, in the luminance. So in the black and white, the luminance is basically our black and white world, our grayscale world, and our human visual system has low acuity. So we, we have a very poor response of chrominance. So chrominance is basically the color in the images. And that has really significant images. So we use that to create 422 and 420 for Blu-rays, for instance, which allows us to still see really good pictures, but we can reduce the bit rate. So for instance, this image here, nice colorful image in the bush. Um, when we go to a grayscale, which is just the luminance, only the black and white, we can still make out quite clearly what this image is all about. But when we go and look at the color information, it's, it's basically, uh, almost impossible to understand what this picture is about because there's no real detail in the chrominance um, or the color information. But when we join them together, of course, we get a nice color picture. So when we come to choosing the monitor for HDR, we all wanna try and not pay too much money, I guess is the thing. And it's uh, always a, a business choice, but. The reason why HDR is so hard is because of the demands and the luminance uh, requirements to get that brightness. So this is a real life example. So you can see here, this is a, a, a dimming HDR monitor and you can see at a patch size, so this is a window patch size at 60%, we start to go and dim. So you can see here on our left-hand side, we're at 800 nits and we go gradually down. So at a full field white, you can measure a thousand nits, for instance, no problem. But if you think of a small white car or something like a, or a white object moving within the scene, as that comes in and out of size, its luminance level will also change as well. So you need to be able to trust your monitor. You need to be able to understand that that luminance level is not going to vary according to the size of that object within the actual um, screen itself as well. Another area which is really probably even more concerning in some respects is that the you can go and calibrate a monitor and you can measure the the d65 white and it's perfect and it's beautiful but as that patch size changes in color so does its color temperature so as you as you make the car or whatever that white object is for instance gets smaller then it won't be, be white anymore it'll actually change in color and this is something that is apparent in pretty well the, the monitors that I've looked at that use utilize dimming in the uh, to try and create a HDR. You can also get things like posterization effects. You'll also get artifacts as objects move through the dimming zone. You can get halo and various very weird artifacts about it. So this is really the reason why ASO have the CG3146 and haven't got a cheaper version of that at this moment in time. And they're obviously working on that, I would suggest. But at this moment in time, if you're going to be grading in HDR and you want critical reference monitor, then you need to have a monitor that you can trust because it is all your decisions in the HDR world are, are based on what you do with that screen in front of you. The other screen that's available as well, which is the OLEDs, and I personally own an LG C1 OLED, and it's a fantastic um, screen. But when we're talking about critical color grading, this is the, the problem. So this was first really brought to the attention by Steve Shaw from Light Illusion, is that the, the red, green, and the blue, so in a OLED, there's white, red, green, and blue pixels. The red, green, and blue basically stop at about 400 nits. So anything above 400 nits, is black and white. So if you had an object up here that might be a clipped color, for instance, it might be yellow because it's clipped in that channel, you wouldn't know it would still appear white to you. So uh, the other aspect is that they go to 700 nits, well, actually about 684, but 700 nits, depending on the screen. And so it's not a 1000 nit type monitor. They are fantastic for client monitors, but they're certainly not suitable for um, critical color grading in HDR. So some of the resources we have available is the um, 
from the ITU. So there's the technical ones like REC 2100, and you should read those as well. But apart from those, there's a lot of operational, creative type documents that are available for working in HDR to give you guidance that, that has been contributed to from particularly people like the BBC uh, and the EBU, where they've uh, put together programs and gone through the trial and error of how they actually did it. So it's 2390 and is, is one example, but there's a whole series of HDR uh, reports, which are all free of charge from the ITU that you can download um, and, and read. And you should get your head around that, even though a lot of it's technical and you might think it's too tech, just read it and try and understand as much as you can, because you'll gradually build up a knowledge. The other one is the EBU as well. The, uh, the tech series, they're mainly free. If you're, if you're in a company that's part of the EBU, you can get a lot of information from them, but they also have a lot of information which is free of charge. They tend to be a little bit more technical. In the SIMPTI, they develop the standards and you pay dollars for those. For instance, we're going to be talking about the uh, SIMPTI reference viewing environment. You have to pay 80 US dollars uh, for that. I'm a SIMPTI member and that cost me $72. So you have to pay for the SIMPTI standards, but they are generally very technical. But I think you should really look at the ITU. They have some fantastic documents there for you. Okay, so let's have a look at the room environment. So this would be a typical room environment where we have our resolve panels there and your monitor with two GUIs. And let's have a look firstly at things like the surround extents. So what the surround extents is, it's basically this area on the wall within your peripheral vision. And it's a critical area as part of that standard on how you should treat that. So in the horizontal version, so your peripheral vision as they take the surround extents is within 90 degrees of your, of your view as a color is sitting there on this back wall here. So 90 degrees on the horizontal, and as we swing around, the vertical is 60 degrees. So basically it's the 16 by nine is if you look at your, the way your eyes work and your vision. So this is about this wall here, this, this whole wall here and how much light is hitting it. So you can have bias lights that may be on the back of the monitor and they shine in and they reflect off, or you might have an, an illuminating light here but that surround extent is your critical environment to make sure that your light levels are correct for when you set up your post suite. Your position when you're sitting there should be 1.5 times the picture height. So this is not the diagonal of the monitor, it's actually the physical vertical height of the picture. So with a CG3146 in 4K, you would be sitting at about 550 uh, two millimeters back. And in HD, the recommended uh, position is for you to sit about 3.5 times the picture height, which is about 1.3 meters on a CG3146. Your position of your actual monitor from your wall here, should be a minimum of seven centimeters up to 2.5 times the screen height of the monitor here. So when you're positioning your, your desk, if you like, from your, from your wall here, you should be looking at around about that. So it looks like my internet is a little bit unstable. So hopefully my voice is not drifting out too much. So your surround light levels should be five nits. So this is the light level coming back off the screen to the colors from this wall here. Your light levels should be D65. The ambient light, which is the general light within the room, you really have to be controlled and not fall onto the screen. Now this to me is a really important part of the post suite, particularly in HDR, where you are looking at high dynamic range with monitors that can go to very low um, black levels. And then it, to me, an significant advantage of the CG3146 is the actual screen. So it's not a gloss screen. It's a more matte screen and it, it um, helps a lot in rejecting um, reflections and what have you. So you've got a keyboard here with all these little 
lights and what have you. In the glossy screen, I find you can get little, you get reflections on the screen. If you've got a practical light in the corner, for instance, you can get reflections on that to the screen. Whereas the ASO monitor helps avoid that. The other thing you do is you get a hood with the CG3146. Now the hood is popular in photography world, but not so much in the post-production world, but it should be something you should consider in, in controlling the light and controlling any flare getting onto your screen. So the 3146 has some significant advantages in that area. So to try and measure those light levels, you would normally use a uh, light meter. So in the cinematography world, we're going to need DOPs as incident light or reflected light, uh, luminance or illuminance. So luminance is the, the brightness of the object, if you like, and illuminance is the amount of light falling on that object in very simple terms. So if you've got an i1 display pro, which a lot of people have, it's actually quite a good little device. So you can measure luminance with that as you do a, a normal monitor, but you need to make sure that you're measuring the surround. So if we go back to here, for instance, you need to measure, not hold it in front of you, otherwise you're measuring the screen. You need to measure the light that's coming off there. And that can act as an ambient light uh, meter and a luminance. Now I have a program called uh, Argyle Color Pro, which is from um, Graham Gill. And this is the screen here. So it's, it connects, so I'm, I'm in the ambient, mode at the moment. So I can use the I1D3 to measure the ambient light levels. At the moment, I've got ambient light levels of 18.86. And you can see this measuring in lux. So illuminance, which is the ambient light level, is measured in lux. If I flick this little, this little uh, lid thing over here, which has got the diffuser on it, it then all of a sudden becomes a luminance meter. You can see now it's gone to spot emission. And if I tap that and I go and measure this screen, for instance, which I know is not D65, just for the purposes of this, you can see that I'm measuring um, 102 nits and there's candela per meter squared there in nits. So this little fella here, it's not a reference meter by any meter in terms of measuring light as you would have, say, a Seconics or something like this, but it'd be a good way to get at least some idea of your light levels if you don't have uh, the access to other, other better instruments if you like high color space as well of course color space can measure lumens because that's what it does and if you've got other programs um, even hcfr you can use that as well if you want to measure lumens so that's a poor man's way if you like is using i1 display pro but at least you'll give you a good idea of getting your light levels correct so again, from the ITU, this is the BT2408. It gives you good guidance about different light levels that you should have in these documents. So you can see here the grading suite. You would normally have a, a ambient light level. So this is illumination. This is in lux of about 25 lux. So if you're wondering, you know, well, how, how bright it should be, and this is not mentioned in the ST2080, uh, by the way, then this, this this guidance can give you an idea of where you should be sitting at. So for instance, if you're doing a theatrical for a feature film where you wanted to go almost black, you'll be looking at a ambient light level of about three lux. That's very, very low. So it's quite useful information within the 2408 that is available to you to um, give you some idea of what you should be targeting at when you're measuring uh, the light levels within your environment. The other area is actually the wall paint. I go into a lot of post-production suites and I've seen yellow bands and I've seen red. I've seen every rainbow color, basically. Interior designers don't like boring gray, but colorists should love boring gray. It's very important to you. Uh, if, you go to, if you have access to Dulux paints, then there's a formula that you can get within the Dulux library um, with the Munsell book of color and you can give them that information, they can make up that paint for you. But a lot of paint stores, I certainly know here in Australia, that they have a little i1 Pro 2, little Spectro from x -Rite. So you can take a color checker chart into your local paint store 
And they should be able to match that color for you so you can get a neutral gray color for your wall. But that's the critical aspect of this is to make sure that that surround extent, the wall you're looking at that's behind your color grading monitor is a neutral gray color. You don't want any uh, other color interfering with the, your, your visual system. So now we're just gonna touch on a little bit of tech because this is really critical as well. So in the normal Rec 709 world, we use 10-bit legal, which in the HDR world, the BBC have come up with a word called narrow. But what it basically means is your peak white is 940 and your black is 64 in a 10-bit system. And that's the, you're normally operating that in Rec 709. If you've been doing Rec 709 projects, that's what Resolve defaults to basically. But when we go to the HDR world, then we want to use as many code values as we possibly can. So in SDI, which is your serial digital cable, it goes to a peak level of 1019 and then a black level of four. And the reason being is because they want to have some stuff up here, there's a little bit of code here so they can do synchronization and some admin. So you lose a few code values at the top and the bottom. If you're doing data full, that's a level of zero all the way through to 1023. But basically the important thing to, to know is that in the HDR world, we're going to be operating in a full range environment. Now there is a bug in the DeckLink software. There's a thing called the VPID, which is a bit like the edit information. It tells the other end what I'm sending you. So can you please set yourself up like that? It's supposed to have the range information, whether I'm legal or whether I'm full, but it doesn't work. So if you go and set up a HDR project and you would select the full range or the data range in your resolve, you must ensure that your monitor, whether it be an ASA or any other brand of monitor, is also set up to match. It's critical that if you're operating in legal range, your monitor is set for legal. If you're operating in full range for HDR, that your monitor is set for full. If you get that wrong or you forget to set that up, you'll have very serious problems when you come to deliver that, that program to your, your clients and customers. So in our PQ, as I've mentioned, it's an absolute NIT uh, reference display referred system. And this is, this is totally different to the way the Rec 709 world has been. So if you're only been operating in HD Rec 709, this is completely different, which you have to think about. So th these values here are very meaningful. So we normally only use 769, the code value up to 769 in a 1000 nit system. So anything above there, we don't use at all. We only use code values below that. So even if 2000, we're only still only using 846 code values, but it's absolutely critical that you understand that your monitor must be calibrated to that NIT level because this whole system of PQ is referenced to 10,000 NIT and everything else that you deliver that your customers will see on their screens at home is dependent on you getting this correct and putting these values into your system. So this is a, an example of simultaneous HDR and SDR. Now I'll admit I'm not a great fan of doing this, but a lot of people like to do this and try this. And this will be on show at the ASO Roadshows in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Singapore. So what you basically have is, in this case, we have our CG3146 and our CG319. So we take the SDIA out of our deck link card or our Ultra Studio Extreme. We take for our HDR and we take the SDIB into our SDR monitor. And you have to, it only works in HD mode. So you need to do some project settings. So it's a bit, a bit fiddly to, to set up. But what you can actually see is you can see the HDR version on your HDR screen and the SDR version of the SDR screen, you can compare the two of them and have a look at them. 
So, but what you have to always remember is that when you're operating in HDR, your human visual system is obviously always gets um, attracted more to the, to the brighter image. And also you have other effects that, as the hunt effect that as the luminous level increases, things appear more colorful. So to do this, uh, it's, it's up to you as a creative, but it's certainly possible to do that, but it does take a little bit of fiddly work to do. Your client screen is also really important. So your, your screens, all the screens within your post suite should match. And your client screen should be done with a 3D LUT. If someone comes along to calibrate your client screen, say it might be a Sony LCD or a Samsung or the LG OLED, it has to be done with a 3D LUT in, rec in the SDR world. In the HDR world, they can only be done with a 1D LUT because of the OLED issues that we saw before. So this is the, there's a couple of products you can from Blackmagic, the extreme, the top of the range extreme, basically the two units that do it. And you get the SDI A and the B. And in the Ultra Studio Extreme, you're using the SDI A and the B at the same time. So not all Blackmagic um, units can do it. It's only the Ultra Extreme 3 and in the card and the, in the Ultra Studio as well. So just have a quick look here at setting up the HDR world. So I've chosen the two pretty well most common ones at the moment, certainly in Australia. So I apologize if it's not the case in your country. But both of them use ST2084 at 1000 nits for your monitor. In Netflix, they want you to go and set your monitor and your grading into a P3D65 color space. Dolby is very similar with a 2084 and a 1000 candela per second uh, per meter squared or nit value monitor. But they wanted to, you to use a P3D65 in a REC 2020 container. So these two are, are different. So this is a pure P3D65 color space, and this is in a container. And I will just go to my resolve if I can do that screen. Where am I here? Okay, so I hope you can all see that. One interesting thing when you do go and do a HDR project, you start working on, for some reason, Resolve will automatically select the enabled Dolby Vision. So if your picture looks really colorful and should and looks wrong, there's a, there's a high chance that you uh, have got the Dolby Vision enabled. So just be aware of that. That's a little thing that I found with Resolve. So in our setup, we have our master settings here. So there's a couple of things here. So this use 444 SDI should be ticked. So that's sending an RGB signal to your monitor. It also turns the HDMI output from your deck link or ultra studio into an RGB signal as well. Our data levels, which we talked about before, you should be setting that to full. And once you've done that, you need to make sure your monitor is also on full and to check it manually. The enable HDR metadata over HDMI, this will turn your client monitor, so your LG OLED, for instance, that will then switch that into HDR10. So we're not monitoring Dolby Vision, we're monitoring always in HDR10. In the color management, this is a key setup that you need to get right with your project. So any production, you need to talk to your production and make sure that you're in total agreement about how this should be managed. Because once you start your project, this, is, this will be your whole guide and you really can't start. So in Resolve, we have the old fashioned Da Vinci YRGB, which is a non-color managed um, system display referred. So in the color managed functions, we have the, the new DaVinci color manage, which works really well. And we have ACES, both of those are color managed. And depending on your production, you'll use one of the, the two. So in this one, we're going to be using the, the color manage. So what the color manage basically does is it in, in uh, Resolve, for instance, in the, in the DaVinci one, I've got some ARRI raw 
on the timeline and it sees, hello, you're an ARRI RAW. So therefore I will make the appropriate settings for you dependent on the choices you make here. So it'll do the hard work for you to bring that camera raw into the, into the timeline color space for you to start grading. So in this system here, we're looking at a, a Disney system. So we've got our timeline color space set for Rec 2020 and the DaVinci Intermediate as our working space. The input color space, this default, so if it doesn't know what is on the timeline, has no metadata or information about it, it will then default back to Rec 7 and Gamma 2.4 or whatever you choose. You can choose you know, a red um, dragon color if you like as well. The timeline working limits is interesting. Normally you would be in with the CG3146, we would be choosing a, a, a working luminance at 1000 nit, but they have an extended range function, which um, from my little testing works. So what happens is the, the array raw, for instance, comes in and gets mapped to 1000 nit. And then you still have a 2000, you have a then a 2000, uh, up to 2000 nit headroom. And then it will then map from there back down to 1000 nit for output. What that basically helps is that I've seen was working with the, the highlights and making that maybe a little bit easier for you. So depending, so that's really something for you to try and see if it works for you. In Disney, we're going to be outputting the color space at Rec 2020, which means that you need to set the CG3146 to a Rec 2020 color space as well, and a Rec 2100 ST284. So that's that EOTF. The reference level for graphics in HDR is for HLG and for PQ is both are running at 203 nits. So your titles and that sort of thing, any white in the titles that is going to be set for 203 nits. You certainly don't want to have your titles uh, fine white on black running at 1000 nits because it will be very um, nasty and not very nice to the people watching. If you've ever seen that, it is quite, um, it's like looking at your phone in the middle of the night, it, uh, your eyes will suddenly shut down. So this limit the gamut to P3D65. So what we've got here, this is, the, this is what they're referring to where they've got P3D65 P3 in a Rec 2020 container. So we're working in 2020 color space, but we're gonna limit our colors to a P3D65. So all our colors on our timeline and our grade are gonna be limited to within the colors that are capable within the monitor itself. If you do a Netflix, um, project, then when you would choose P3D65 and then your output color space are the same. So in other words, these two different factors, technically you would say that they're exactly the same, but in real world testing, I have seen some shifts and Netflix make a point of this in their documentation that they see some color shifts. Now, whether they're, I see it on in the CIE, whether they're perceptible or not, it's probably dependent on the color. But once you start down your project path, you need to remain on that project path. You don't then suddenly go and change from REC, from DCI P3 to REC 2020 and limit the output color space because you will see some slight color shifts within that gamut itself um, that, that I've noticed. The other thing you've got here is enabled Dolby Vision. Again, you need to make sure that you talk with production on this and say, are you happy with this? Netflix now does accept version four Dolby, but again, you need to ensure that your information that you work with production that you're gonna make your deliverable to is correct from the start of your project. This here is really critical. This mastering display. This information here is what's used within the metadata to tell things like your LG screen at home, how the project was mastered so I can then map down to my capabilities. If you remember that the LG OLED, for instance, can do say 684, 700 nits. So it will internally map the 1000 nits down to its capabilities, but it's reliant on you having this correct information for that mapping to work. So in a Netflix environment, for instance, we're here running at a thousand nits, 
a BT 2020 color space, D65, ST2084 EOTF and full range. I can't emphasize enough how important this metadata here, this is the 2086 metadata. So you can, so if you were doing um, Netflix, for instance, you would choose this one. You would do 1000 P3 D65, for instance. So that metadata is then embedded within the file system that you're going to deliver to your client. So you, this really is a, the most critical part of having a successful project delivered to your, to your clients. Yeah. Okay. So just to touch on the GUIs, I go into a lot of suites and I'm sometimes amazed. The GUI monitors are like 250 nits, they're blue, and people pay no attention to them. But the GUI monitor is in your visual site and you're looking at, so even though it might not be displaying a white, the, the greys are still running it the wrong color temperature. And it's quite easy to get your GUI to be correct, but it should be running at D65 and 100 nit around about that area. <clears throat> so it's not overwhelming your, your visual system. Uh, the Flex Scan from Azer, they have business monitors there, which are, um, are, are very, very linear. So they can do basically a Rec 709 color space. And so your, your GUI monitor can look on yeah, a reasonable match if you like. But you can set that monitor up as you can set other GUI monitors up and just use your, your i1 display uh, pro or whatever media you may have and just pay attention to your GUI monitor and make sure that they're uh, reasonable within the environment and that will help you a lot. In the client monitors, you must use a 3D light to calibrate. I come across a lot of clients who just think you can use the CMS controls within the monitor, they don't work. If you're going to be working in Rec 709 with a, with a client monitor and you want them to match your reference monitor so you don't get arguments from your client, you must use a 3D LUT. The LG OLEDs, they can have a 3D LUT internally, but if you're using, say, a Sony or a Panasonic or whatever other brand, then you need to use a LUT box and they're not expensive. But if you want them to match, you can't match them without using a 3D LUT. In the HDR world, it's a little bit more complex. So you really only have the availability to, to do a 1D LUT. So this is in the LG OLED and you rely on the monitor matrix for that to then um, do that gamut mapping. And they work very, very well, to be honest with you. They're, they're quite impressive, but you can do a, a very accurate 1D LUT calibration. The critical aspect that you, if you're working in um, HDR and you're doing a Netflix program and you've got an LG OLED, the LG OLED cannot do P3. Even though it might say it can do and you might force it with the special code to force it into P3, it actually is just uh, window addressing. It's really not doing P3. So it will see P3 as actually Rec 709. So if you look at your CG3146 with, a, with an image, a colorful image, and you look at that same image on your LG OLED, then it will look desaturated. And there is no real work uh, fixed to that. The only thing you can possibly do is get the color control in the LG OLED and increase that to get some sort of match. If you're working in the Disney workflow where you're using a Twenty color gamut, then the LG OLED recognizes Rec 2020, and therefore the, the the pictures should look pretty good to each other. That's just some one thing to watch out for if you are in doing a Netflix and you've got an LG OLED with a client there, and you've got the, the it says I'm HDR10. The color saturation will look uh, desaturated because it thinks it's Rec 709 if you're sending it P3, and it's not an easy fix. Uh, that's from my experience. The other thing was that resolve. So HDMI, HDMI tunneling is that sending the HDMI metadata down that uh, the HDMI signal, which is what we saw before. And that's all the tunneling means. Just says it's a little flag which says, "Hey, I'm HDR. Please go into HDR mode."
But just to have a look at some of the final ones where we come through for the graphics and titles. So there is some, these are from the ITU documents. And you can see here, there's some reference levels that you can expect when you're working with HDR. So you can try these out if you're, if you're not used HDR before and you want to get a feel for where levels are. So your, your, gray, your standard gray card, for instance, this, this is the NIT level it should be sitting at and the reference level for your graphics, as we mentioned before, is 203. So you can see that on the resolve. So we go into resolve um, scopes, for instance. I can get that up. There we go. So the resolve scopes here, uh, we've got in the, our CIE chromaticity, and you can choose different color spaces. So I can see the REC 2020 here and the DCI-P3. And in our waveform monitor, I think it's here. Yes, it is. Waveform scale. You can go down and select HDR 2084. And then that turns this scale down here into NITs value. So you've got 1,000 NITs. So you can use this to set where you are and have a look at where your, your content is sitting. And interesting enough, you can see here that the bulk of this content, which is this uh, shot of the, the beach, for instance, is sitting below 100 NITs. So that's quite common. So when Dolby first started this, they expected everything to be basically sitting like SDR, but then you've got your peak. You can see these peak levels going up here to 600 and four and 500 nits. But a lot of your content will be down around here. And this also can be quite useful to see, i.e. chromaticity. You can select the other uh, waveform monitors, vector scopes and what have you. But that gives you an idea to make sure that you're operating within the P3 color space and not having uh, colors outside of that. So the other thing in this document of 2408 is the reference level. So again, if you're not experienced in HDR, these documents give you some idea of where things should sit. So you've got the light skin tone, medium skin tones of how you should expose that within the HDR environment. So again, these documents, if you're starting off in HDR, I encourage you to go and download them. So they're free of charge. And just read through them. Some of it can be quite technical, there's no doubt. But this is a technical type of industry we are in, apart from the creative. But they, there are, is a lot of work that's been done to try and help creatives understand where levels should be and how things should be exposed. So just summing up, in our basic resolve settings, the Netflix is a SD284. They use a P3 D65 color space purely. And Disney use a REC 2020 color space, but you limit the gamut to P3 D65. So technically they should be exactly the same, but in practice, there are some slight differences within the resolve system, the way it gamut maps. If you're into YouTube, which you should be, because there's some fantastic stuff on YouTube. And I would just also mention that I think the world is now using YouTube as a major content provider. It's not some, um, poor man's uh, distribution anymore. But if you want to process and have your HDR videos on YouTube, you must have the correct formatting. If you don't, then it simply will say, sorry, I can't do it. So your transfer function should be PQ or HLG, depending on what you're working in. Your primaries are REC 2020, not DCI P3, but REC 2020. Your matrix is REC 2020 and then called a non-constant luminous. So that's a a bit more of an advanced thing that we need to worry about. That's basically the way we work normally, if you like, we have for a long time. And the PQ signaling, you should mention, remember we had, what was the monitor we were mastering on? So we were monitoring on a 1000 nit, we we're monitoring at D65, we were working in a P3 color space and it was at full range. That's what this stuff is here. And that's really important. And then you've got your max fall and max CLL. Now that's a bit harder to come by, if you don't have that, YouTube will default to the BVMX 300, the old Sony um, 1000 nit OLED that was used. So that's the, the basis of what you need to do to set up for getting started with HDR. And I hope that was useful. I can see City there now about to take over. And I will hand back to City and stop my screen sharing. But thank you very much, everybody. All right. 
Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for the insights on HDR and hope uh, that clarifies everybody HDR questions or uh, technical questions. Yeah. Okay. So thank you everyone for still staying on. Um, okay. Before we go on some questions here, uh, shall we do a little bit of poll uh, for our upcoming road shows? Hang on. I think I need to change the host. Hang on just a moment. All right. Okay, I'm going to do a poll on our upcoming road shows. Uh, yeah, hopefully you guys can answer this and um, yeah. And then after that, we'll go on to the questions and answer. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, I think in the uh, yeah in the meantime of uh, in the meantime, I'll just um, uh, do up some uh, questions that was uh, raised by Tom Gleason. Yep. Okay, so Stuart, are there any recommendations for portable HDR monitors for use while shooting on location? <laughs> um, okay, that is, so mostly you have high brightness monitors um, for on location and they're not HDR. Um, so ASO themselves don't have any true HDR monitors at that range and I'm not sure that there are any real true HDR. Most of those monitors will use dimming. So that is a real issue. So if you, Tom, I, if I was on location, I wouldn't use a dimming monitor to try and um, look at my exposure under any circumstances because that exposure, uh, the luminance level will vary with the content of the actual screen itself. So it's quite difficult, but what you can, if you're looking at a general uh, view, I've actually put a, a video on our website using the HDR functions in the SDR monitor. So the, so the ASO monitors can go from uh, up to say 300 and maybe a bit more nit level and then down to about 0.2 of a nit, but they'll track the HDR curve absolutely correctly and the color gamut is correctly. So any content that's within 0.2 of a nit up to 300 nit will display in exactly the same fashion as if you had a 3146 on set. Um, but I know, and so I don't want to, I can't talk about other brands monitors because that's not the right thing to do, but I have measured a lot of those monitors and I've looked at the dimming and the dimming is, um, you would have to, if you wanted to, to look at the correct exposure, you use them as a high brightness monitor, then you would have to make sure that the dimming was turned off and not on. As soon as you have dimming on, those monitors, then you really cannot say what the true exposure of that of that um, shot would be. If that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Tom, hope that clarifies your question. Uh, okay, so next question from. Uh, oh, can I just can I just butt in there too, uh, yeah, sure. at, at uh, Tom, at, in Sydney, we'll have a an example setup for what I've just explained with a camera uh, feeding um, a log curve of some variety, we don't know the camera yet, uh, with a LUT, but also then um, showing it monitoring HDR as well. So, so that'll be, give you an idea of what it would look like um, when you're on set using that style of um, configuration. So you could actually have a quite a cheap setup uh, with say like a 2420 or uh, not the 2420, but the 2700 which can have those HDR curves in there um, as do it. But there's no true HDR reference field monitor that I'm aware of at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, since you're mentioning about the roadshow, right, what can we expect to see at the roadshows? Okay, so at the roadshow, we're going to have the onset set up. So it's going to be a camera into a CG3, a CG2700, the new monitor. 
So that'll be calibrated to say Rec 789, but it'll also then have the ability to have uh, different log um, view LUTs in, but also then have it set up so you can actually monitor in an HDR. So of course all the camera, cinematography cameras can do HDR, no problems. So we'll just take a log to PQ LUT, load that into the monitor so you can see that. We're going to have a setup of the a VFX. So using a VFX and using the Color Navigator 7 network. Uh, we've got an, a video production setup where we'll have an Adobe suite running. So you can run an Adobe suite, which is Premiere Pro, Photoshop and After Effects. And then we'll have the HDR grading set up, set up which is going to have the simultaneous, so the 319 and the 3146 together. And so you can say whether that's for you or not for you. So you, but you can get an idea of what that actually looks like in, in looking at real pictures, if you like, and not from a brochure. I think okay. that's it. I don't All think right. I'm missing Great. And uh, I think there will also be more HDR topics that we will talk about at the road shows. Yeah. Uh, uh, yep. Okay. There are still some questions over here. Okay. Just a quick one from GRT. Uh, yeah, from Jati, is there any particular workflow in production sites, such camera setting, et cetera? So Jati, I think this is, uh, uh, okay. it's, this is about uh, on-site production setup yeah. here. So, and yeah. This will be at our roadshows. And oh, really? uh, yes. yeah, this will be, it. and we will show you the, the settings and all that for the camera to the monitor, to the monitor and all. So, uh, Jesse, I think we will get back to you on this. We yeah, so might... can I, I, I'll just jump in there. So that, that basically, so you're on set world, you're going to be monitoring, um, normally in some sort of a log format, so if it's an Alexa, it'll be log C or what have you. You don't norm, you won't come out in a HDR function into um, into a monitor, but you would need a lot to do that if you wanted to measure, if you wanted to do that. As City said, we'll have that on display at the roadshow. Yes, uh, GRT, I'm not sure where, which, uh, which country are you from? I will follow up with you afterwards. So, um, okay, there are other few more questions. Um, however, we will wrap it up and we will answer your questions uh, later on. Uh, we will follow up with you via email. Um, Okay, so the roadshow's dates uh, will also be, uh, we will also let you know the roadshow dates. For now, the roadshows are happening in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Singapore. However, based on the poll that we've seen uh, uh, afterwards, we will decide more whether we will have it in Jakarta or Malaysia or other uh, elsewhere. Yeah. So, um, so have you got the dates for the proposed roadshow? Because that's Warren's asking that question. Uh, okay, that's yeah, okay. So right from the start right now, uh, Sydney, we're going to have it on the 19th and 20th of May and followed by Melbourne, which is on the, hang on, 20, 26th and 27th of May. And then Singapore will be on the 2nd and 3rd of June. And then lastly will be Brisbane on the 9th and 10th of May. Yep. Uh, we, will, we will send you all this information by, uh, via email. You should receive it in one, two days. And thank you so much for your questions. Don't worry, we will, we will follow up with you guys also on that. And uh, so we will be wrapping up this webinar. Thank you so much uh, for making time to attend this event. Do join our newsletter to get updates on upcoming events, latest products and giveaways. This will be available in our follow-up emails as well. So thank you, Stuart. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and goodbye. Till I see you guys again. Bye-bye.